What we have here is what's inside a 944 transmission. These are the gear clusters, the shafts, and the shift forks. And over here we have a little more of the shift linkage, the reverse linkage, the reverse idler, the needle bearings, snap rings, bolts, and those sorts of things. Some springs. So the shaft at the top, this long shaft here, this is the main input shaft. It's connected to the drive shaft right there on that spline end end which is connected to the clutch which is connected to the engine. So whenever the engine's spinning and the clutch is uh, not disengaged, the, this shaft spins. And these gear clusters on the top reside in this orientation on the shaft uh, for the front and the back. And then these gear clusters and the two bearings they reside on this shaft which is your pinion shaft. Your pinion gear is this gear here, it's part of this shaft and it's what mates to the to the ring gear. The ring gear is bolted to the diff. The differential turns the axles. The axles are connected to the wheels and turn the rear wheels. So what's important to know about a transmission is kind of how it all works. So there's all these different gear ratios. Actually first gear starts with this little gear here turning this big gear on this cluster. So that means for every one revolution the engine makes it only turns a portion of this gear. So that's your, your low gear, your first gear. Um, the straight cut teeth here, that's for reverse, so we're not going to talk about that. So this is second gear, this is the next largest input gear, and so this is the next smallest uh, uh, output shaft gear, so this is second gear. And then we go to third gear, third gear is this gear again would be on this shaft right next to this one, so this would be third gear, it's a little bit larger. And then on the other side of this cluster is fourth gear, fourth gear is a little larger than um, third gear, and actually, if, I don't know how well you can tell, but, and I don't know what the exact ratio is, but the, the output shaft side of fourth gear and the input shaft side are very close to each other. So that's probably pretty close to a one-to-one -one ratio. And then on the end of the transmission here, on the tail, this is our fifth gear. So fifth gear is our largest gear on the input shaft, and it actually turns a smaller gear on the output shaft. So that means for every one revolution the engine makes, the, uh, the output shaft, the pinion shaft, is actually doing more than one revolution. So that's your highway gear, your, your top gear. And the way that it transmits energy from the input shaft to the output shaft is, is it has to kind of lock together. So the way these gear sets are made, one gear out of any of the sets is on a bearing on one of these needle bearings and can freewheel and then when we actually shift gears we lock that gear to a shaft and then that's actually what transmits the energy. So if we look here at fourth gear we see that the spot on the input shaft or on the output shaft, the pinion shaft for fourth gear is splines, the spot here is a smooth surface. So this is where that bearing would go so that this one could freewheel and this one is fixed to the shaft and then the same for um, third gear, uh, this is actually a press fit onto this part of the shaft, and then there's a bearing here, and then for first and second gear, obviously first and second are actually machined onto the shaft, so they spin with the shaft, and then first and second, they correspond with these two spots on the pinion shaft, and so they, they freewheel. And you can see that there's a spline between those two gears. This spline holds the the synchro housing, and the synchro is really a lock, and I'll show how that works, but that's going to lock the gears when you, when you shift. And then of course you've got a bearing on the end, and then for your fifth gear, on the pinion shaft, fifth gear is blind, and on the input shaft, fifth gear is on, on a bearing. So exactly how this gear cluster works. Remember that the center part here has the splines on it, so the center part is fixed to the shaft where these gears on the outboard side these gears on the outboard side they take a a bearing not that one how about that one that's the the needle bearing that would slide in there I'm going to take this apart here show you just the center piece the center piece it actually has a ring on the outside which can slide I'll, uh, I'll pop this apart. 
there's two little spring wires, one on either side. It's gonna pull it out with your screwdriver or your fingernail. And then these three little pins are gonna fall out. So now we can see that this freely slides. It's like a, a cog and a tooth thing. And, and one slides over the other. Right. These little keys that go in these slots, and in fact, on the outer ring, you can actually see there's an indentation where that key falls into, the little nub on the top falls into that slot. And what it does is, so they're spring-loaded, those metal springs push outward to give you a little bit of resistance, and that kind of helps it snap into gear. It actually does two things. It helps you have a positive kind of snap to lock into gear and hold it into gear, but it also, when you start moving this ring, it applies a little bit of a, of a side pushing pressure to these little keys. So this goes together. You've got to make sure that the, the, the key, the spot for the key, lines up with the hole for the key in the inner cog. You put it together, you put your keys in place, that's where it helps if you're an octopus, you have lots of fingers, you put your spring clip in, one end of the spring clip has a little hook on the end, so I start with that and then just kind of bend the rest of it into place. And now what I like to do for the other spring clip is I don't like to put the hooks on the same key, so this key has the hook. This key does not. This key has the tail. So I'm going to flip it over and I'm going to have this wire on the other side start with the hook on that key and then the tail going in the opposite direction. So that means the hook will be here and the tail will go this way. So now this kind of locks it so it can't come off. The next step is this is the synchronizer brake ring. This is brass or bronze. Uh, some cars it's steel. And it has little tabs on the side of it here. These tabs interlock with these keys, like that. So this can't spin. This is locked into place. And so what happens when you start moving this collar on the outside, it actually pushes these little keys over so that they push against the synchro ring the lock ring, the brake ring, and this brake ring pushes against the gear. So the gear itself has a bit of a taper machined on the surface here, nice and smooth, and there's a taper inside this ring, the synchro brake. So when it's just gently pushed into place, it can spin. But when you give it a little pressure, it locks in that taper and it acts as a brake, and the friction keeps the two together. So when you go to shift, Remember, one of these is going to be freewheeling on the shaft and the other is fixed to the shaft. So one is going to be spinning at a different rate than the other. When you start moving the shift lever, it starts moving this ring over, pushes against that, that brake ring. That brake ring locks the, uh, the, the gear or the gear in the, so that it stops spinning. And then when you move it all the way over, it clicks into place and now it has locked onto these tabs on the gear. So it's one fixed unit. Now it's, it's rotating together. So now any, any of the engine's force going to this gear is transmitted through the shaft. Again, because of those splines. And then when you take it out of gear, this pops back that way. And now this gear can, can freewheel again and can spin. When people talk about synchros wearing out, they really mean two things. This ring, as it starts to wear, this ring's actually in pretty rough shape. You can see kind of polished spots and everything. It has withstood a lot of heat. That's going to be replaced. But you can also measure the gap. The gap here, there's a speck on, I think it's, I don't know, half a millimeter to one millimeter gap is acceptable. This is getting smaller than that, so this ring needs to be replaced. As it wears down, it moves closer and closer to the gear. So that's one thing. These, these synchros can wear down. As they wear down, when you go to shift into gear, it doesn't apply enough braking pressure, so this keeps spinning a little bit. And as this keeps spinning, when you try to have this outer cog part engage with that, it might be easier if I slide it out a little bit, if it doesn't line up properly, you get the dreaded kind of 
gear grinding noise, which that gear grinding is really these teeth on the synchro collar hitting these teeth on the on the gear. So it's not actually these gear teeth grinding. These gear teeth are always meshed, but it's these teeth here. So that's what you hear when you have a grinding transmission, because you're trying to force it into gear. The brake is not slowing down the cog enough, and so you you don't get enough of a slowdown, and so you get that crunch, crunch, crunch noise. So these forks are the shift forks, and so each of these forks slides into the slots here. So this, this end fork is for fifth gear, and it slides right into this coupler. The first second fork is this one, and it slides right into this spot on the synchro, and then your third fourth is this one, and it slides right into this slot. And so all three of these shafts, I don't know how you can see this, they each have a like, little notch at the end, and they line up. All three of them can line up together. This bar is what comes out of the side of the transmission that the shift rod goes to. It goes to this end. So when you move the lever in the cabin, when you move it side to side, it pulls this bar in or out. And when you go forward or backwards, it gives this bar a rotation. So you can see this little, this little tab on it. This tab sits right here between all of these forks, and when you go side to side, it moves this from side to side. So if you move this all the way up, this is going to move the first second fork. So now when this tab is lined up, when you go forward or back, it's going to shuttle or slide this one bar, this one shift bar, forward or backwards. And then if it's in the middle spot, it does, it operates the 3-4 the shift fork, which is right here again, and then when it's all the way at the other direction, it's in the bottom bar, so it can operate, you know, the, the fifth and reverse fork. This little series of spring-loaded pins on this pin up here, they all go into the ends of the of the shift forks here. I don't know if you can see these these kind of scalloped notches and scalloped notches here. And this one has a hole for that pin. This all goes together so that once one shift rod has moved or slid in one direction, the others are locked out. So they can't, it can't go into multiple gear clusters at once. The way reverse gear works is a little different. So to reverse, remember the engine always spins in one direction. All of these gears, so again, if the engine is spinning one way, it's turning this shaft, the output shaft, the, the pinion shaft the other way, which then turns the ring gear. So for reverse, we need to change the direction, so we have to add an extra gear, so this is to, to reverse the direction. So what we have is we have an idler gear. This little straight cut gear here is an idler. And so it goes between the straight cut gears on the input shaft and the straight cut gears right there on this, uh, on this synchro ring. So what happens is, in fact, this has its own little synchro brake and everything right here, and its own little taper. So when this pushes against here, it's locked, and when it's uh, out, it's, it, it spins freely. You can see that one side of the teeth on this idler gear have a little taper to them, and one side of the teeth on this gear have a taper. So this gear actually rests or resides just dis disengaged from here, under normal operation. And then when you go to shift into reverse, there's this, this kind of bar linkage which goes into the slot here. And when you move the shift lever, it's going to operate this and move this. So the first thing it's going to do when you go to shift into reverse is it's going to push this, it's going to push this gear against the, the synchro brake to, to try to you know, slow it down, to slow down that shaft from spinning. And then once it's it once it's slowed down or stopped, as you keep pushing, it's going to push this in so it meshes with the gear cluster, and now reverse is engaged, and you can go backwards. And when you shift out of reverse, this just releases and moves back into its disengaged position.